right, well, hello, everybody. Um, good to be back at LSFMM. Um, I can get us started off. I'm going to be talking about uh, polymorphic k-funks, which is kind of just a fancy way of saying um, k-funks that have the same API but are actually implemented in two different ways, depending on the context in which they're called. Uh, so I'll start by giving a little bit of background on uh, k-funks, um, what exactly I mean here, what the motivation is for this, and then we can talk about the uh, possible design. So as a refresher, or for those of you who don't know, uh, k-funks are essentially BPF helper programs, but without UAPI constraints. Um, and they're called by a different instruction in the BPF uh, instruction set. Um, but otherwise, they're conceptually basically the exact same. Uh, they're a way for BPF programs to call into the main kernel um, and interact with it. You can look up uh, map elements. Um, that's a helper program, actually. But you can get a K pointer to like reference a stacked uh, a task struct. You can uh, build an RB tree. You can do all these kinds of things. And so Kfunks are really just building blocks for BPF programs to interact with the main kernel. Um, uh, yeah, so some of them are ubiquitous, they're universal. Uh, BPF task acquire, BPF task release, um, those mean the same thing regardless of what kind of program you're running in, where you are. Obviously, you might use them in different ways. You know, maybe you have one program that's, that's putting a task into a map and it's using, a, it's using an RB tree to sort by run queue delay or the amount of I.O. you're doing or whatever. In something like SCEDx, uh, you're probably using this um, to implement scheduling decisions. But these are ubiquitous is the point. Um, other k-funks, however, are very context-specific. Um, and that means that they really may only have any meaning at all or be appropriate to call within specific contexts. So again, for something like SCEDx, we have a bunch of k-funks that you use to implement scheduling decisions. You wouldn't want to call these or you shouldn't be able to call these from random tracing programs or something like that. Um, and in addition, even for the context-specific semantics where you only would call it from a struct ops context, even within that struct ops map, there may be different semantics that you want for the k-funk or different ways that it should be implemented depending on which struct ops program it's called from. So for example, maybe the API is the same, but if you call it from struct ops program A, then the implementation has to be different than struct, op struct ops program B. Um, and so to kind of show you what I mean, I'm gonna do a quick aside and talk about uh, a SCEDx concept called dispatch queues. Um, conceptually speaking, they're essentially uh, the same as a run queue, or they're, they're, they're similar to a run queue. They're the basic building blocks of scheduler policies. Um, there's a local dispatch queue per CPU. That really is kind of the same thing as a run queue. That's what the main kernel pulls from when it's deciding which tasks to run next. Uh, but you can have a dispatch queue. You can create a dispatch queue per LLC, per NUMA node. Um, you could have a global one where you do global FIFO. You could have a per C group. Um, and the idea is really that it's, it's the abstraction layer for the BPF program to be able to say, hey, I have a task. Here's a dispatch queue, main kernel, please put this task on this dispatch, excuse me, this dispatch queue. And uh, by way of example, in a global FIFO uh, scheduler, you would have a single global dispatch queue. And when a task is being enqueued, you would just put it at the back of this global dispatch queue and then later on, uh, the kernel can pull from this dispatch queue uh, to run the task. Um, now to do this dispatching, we have this k-funk here called SEX BPF dispatch. And the kind of weird thing about this is that the, the API is pretty self-evident, right? You have a task, you're putting it into this dispatch queue, which is an object that's managed by the main kernel, but there's also a k-funk to create. But the BPF program is saying, hey, main kernel, put this task in this dispatch queue. You understand what that, uh, the main kernel knows what that means. But um, the scheduler is tricky, and in different code paths, you can and can't do certain things. So for example, um, on the ops.selectcpu path or the NQ path, um, this is when a task is, select CPU is called when a task is either waking up or being forked, and it allows the scheduler to, uh, to hint uh, to a CPU that the task should be migrated to before it's enqueued as an optimization. So, for example, you could find an idle core, reserve the idle core, and then say, hey, migrate the task to this idle core, and then when the task is enqueued, you can dispatch it to that, that CPU, and boom, it can just run there and run in an idle core. Um, whereas on ops.dispatch, kind of confusingly named, that's actually called when a CPU is out of tasks to run and uh, it's gonna go idle if you don't find a new one. Um, now, there are different semantics depending on where you are. If you're in the ops.selectcpu or the ops.nq path, um, you can't drop the, the, uh, the CPU's run queue lock. And the run queue lock is, is kind of the main uh, synchronization mechanism for a CPU and the scheduler. Um, if you dropped it on this path, then all sorts of bad things can happen because the rest of the system is assuming that you won't do that, so you'll eventually crash. Um, if you dispatch from this path, it's called a direct dispatch. 
you're basically saying, okay, the scheduler is being told this task is now waking up, the scheduler is learning that this task exists, and instead of enqueuing the task in the scheduler directly, for example, putting it into an RB tree or something like that, um, you're saying, okay, just throw it directly onto a dispatch queue and um, the main kernel will manage it for me. On the other hand, on the ops.dispatch path, you can drop the RQ lock. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with, with scheduler internals, this is actually the balance path. And so in the main scheduler, we hit this balance path. It means that the CPU is going to go idle if you don't find a task for this, uh, the scheduler doesn't find a task to run. And you can drop the run queue lock here because you could maybe, um, uh, you could pull a task from like another run queue or something like that. And in order to do that, you have to be able to drop your run queue locks so that you can acquire your run queue lock and their run queue lock in the right order without deadlocking. So every, every scheduler has to follow these constraints, um, but you can do different things. Um, uh, some other constraints as well. Uh, in Opsot Dispatch, you can dispatch multiple tasks. So let's say that you had a special scheduler where all scheduling decisions were made from a single CPU. Um, you could say you could be pulling tasks from some kind of a queue and then saying you run on CPU one, you run on CPU three, you run on CPU zero, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas for select CPU and in queue, you can only dispatch yourself, uh, which makes sense, right? I mean, this is like a task lifecycle event. Um, and you shouldn't, it would, wouldn't really make sense to start just making decisions for other tasks in the system at that point. So the re result here is that you have what's conceptually um, the same API uh, with different constraints, but the same actions happening, but you have very different, very different uh, requirements and different implementations, therefore. Um, so can we explicitly support this in the BPF framework is kind of the question here. Um, we use per CPU variables to do this right now. So if you were hitting the select CPU path, we set a per CPU variable, we call the program, and then if the program calls the kfunk, the kfunk checks to see if this per CPU variable is set and then does something different depending on whether it's set or not. So it's, you can work around it, it's not horrible, but the question is like, th this is potentially gonna be a common, I don't know, maybe not, but a, a pattern that struct ops implementations especially may have, to, um, may have to accommodate, so maybe we wanna make it easier for them. Um, so what can we do to, one, one idea that may or may not work, um, and maybe there's a better way to do it, so please let me know if you think that's the case. Uh, but right now, um, the way that a kfunk is invoked is every kfunk is associated with exactly one BTF ID, and when you issue a B, uh, BPF instruction to call a kfunk, you're calling it with that BTF ID, and libbpf will figure out which kfunk you wanna call, and we'll figure out what, what, what BTF ID you wanna call, and then in the kernel that uh, the kfunk that you're trying to call, you'll patch the address in, and you'll actually call it when the, when the program runs. Um, so that's the, kind of the problem, right? Uh, what we're trying to say is, from the BPF program's perspective, well, I wanna call this kfunk SEX BPF dispatch, but in reality, we're actually trying to call a totally separate kfunk with a different BTF ID. So, Basically, just, it's, a, it's just a different mechanism than what we currently use for calls. So how can we extend this? I mean, the seemingly obvious answer, potentially, is that the verifier asks the struct ops implementation um, what kfunk it actually should use. Uh, so for example, um, we could add a new callback that's invoked from the verifier that says, okay, for every member of the struct ops program, Every time we see a kfunk call, you call back into the, the struct ops implementation with a new callback, something like this kfunk validate relloc function here. And um, the uh, BPF program will be responsible, sorry, the struct ops implementation will be responsible for saying, here's the actual kfunk ID that you should use instead, or that's actually not allowed, don't, don't load this program, or now nah, just use the one that's already there, that's fine. Um, I, okay, I'll talk about it in a second. So, Assuming it works, which I prototyped it and it mostly works, but I'm probably missing some corner cases because it crashed once. Um, the pros of this is that I think it's a relatively ergonomic API uh, for struct ops imp implementations at least. You know, the core BPF framework is finding all the places where kfunks are invoked. It's associating those with the, the, the struct ops member, the struct ops map member that they're being invoked in, and then you just have to decide uh, which kfunk you should actually use. Um, it also gives struct ops implementations a way to reject improper kfunk calls at verify time instead of at runtime. And so one thing that we do in SCEDX is um, for every, every struct ops member, we statically, uh, we create a mask of allowed kfunk calls that you can, you can invoke. And then in the kfunk implementation, 
we when you call the, the we have macros where when you call the the program we set math we set bits saying like what you're calling and then in the kfunk K, uh, implementation we check to see that the bits correspond to what you're actually allowed to call. Um, that's kind of complicated and it's not great. And so if we did something like this, maybe this is a way for us to do this statically. Um, the other problem though, which I haven't really fully figured out in my head is, um, at least with SCEDX, you have to also only enforce that kfunks are called in specific order sometimes. So you can call kfunk A and then later call kfunk B in a nested fashion if, for example, you take an interrupt during a kfunk and then you call another kfunk to make a scheduling decision, whereas it wouldn't be correct to call B and then A. Um, so I don't know if this would actually give you the ability to, to validate that. I have to think about that. Um, on the other side, on the con side, I don't know. It's also kind of a weird API because we already have callbacks to check members of, um, of a struct ops uh, map entry. Those are more, at least from what it seems like, used for validating that like non-function uh, callbacks are correct. Like if you pass a map value, or sorry, a flag, like a flags entry where you specify what the program should do with some bits, you can verify that they're correct or you know stuff like that. It's not really about verifying the actual function itself. Um, the other con, of course, is there's more callback logic in the verifier. I know that some people really don't like that design, and I, I understand why. Um, but it is kind of what we're using, and so it's, I don't really see any other way that we could do it, at least in the current, current implementation. Um, and the other kind of weird thing, which I'll talk about a little more in the next slide, is that uh, it requires runtime logic for what's really a static configuration. You know, the, I don't think there would ever be a case where a struct ops implementation would say, for this BPF program, you actually do want to use this kfunk in this struct ops uh, program, whereas in the other one you wouldn't. Like you just always want to map it to this other kfunk in this member of the struct ops program. And so, if we could express that in some kind of build semantics, uh, maybe that would be more ideal and even an even better UI for uh, for the struct ops um, implementations. Um, how much time do we have? I think we have plenty. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it would be nicer to do this at build time, but I don't know. It would also be kind of a pain in the neck to implement. Um, and I think if we're gonna go towards the more build-driven kfunk APIs, that we probably have other things that we should do first. Like, uh, you, as most of you probably know, you have to, we have these macros where you surround kfunk implementations that disable some compiler warnings because um, kfunks uh, could be globally linked but not actually used by anybody in the kernel because they're used by BPF programs and so the compiler can say, hey, there's no prototype and stuff like that. Um, so it would probably be better to have some kind of like export kfunk macro where we, we build all of it, we put all this in the build pipeline and, and express what kfunks are that way instead of the approach we have now where you have this BTF sets and then you register it. Um, but I do think that in general it's probably a good idea for us to go in the direction of, of struct ops implementation statically expressing all of this in, at build time and then having the build machinery um, to implement it. Um, I'm also, I don't know, I mean, this, this would be useful for SCEDX, but I don't know how universally useful people think this would be, and if this is something that we think we should actually even bother doing. Um, you know, we're trying to go in the direction, I think, of making struct ops implementations accessible to, to people in the kernel if they want to provide ways for people to extend the kernel without having to add UAPI or add stuff that they need to guarantee that they'll maintain indefinitely. So I think it's useful to make it easier. Um, but you know, in both this, in this case, you can work around it with per CPU variables as well. So uh, maybe there's maybe there's other things that we should be focusing on for usability and whatnot in the interim instead. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I had so far. Yeah, anybody have any thoughts? Um, I have one one question. Like, did you also think about like how we can detect availability of of K funds? Like when you have this. Uh, design proposals, like when you, when you have applications probing whether they are available or not, like? Like, in, in other words, have it be like a user space driven thing? Um, I did think about that. I mean, I, I don't know exactly how that would work. I would actually love to hear Andre's thoughts on that, but I think, I, I, yeah, I mean, if we can express some way for, for applications, I, I, don't, I don't think so, and the reason is that like from the application's perspective, it is, it is only calling one kfunk, right? Like the application has no idea that there's two implementations. And I think the kernel has to be the one to say, actually, no, this is, we, we actually have two and you do the relocation in the kernel. Um, so I think that libvpf probably shouldn't be involved at all here, but. 
Yeah. So my general point is that we already have this concept with helpers, right? We have one helper with fixed ID, but multiple implementations depending on the program type. For example, get stack has like three, four different implementations depending on K-probe versus trace point and all this stuff. We have that concept. Right. We should just add it to KFunk, I think. Okay. Like for user, it should be the same function, right? It should be like one declaration that is generated into vmlinux.h that's used from whatever program type it is, whatever struct ops callback it is, and then verifier is smart enough to say, ah, okay, so you want to use this kind of conceptual helper, but this is the implementation, right? I think that should also solve our problem with this impulse stuff. Which is quite ugly, right? Oh, right yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Where, like the like... verifier substitutes extra argument, but users doesn't care, doesn't need to know. And so we have like pound defines like this is the normal name and like it actually is impl and all stuff. So I think maybe we should look at this more holistically. Don't make it struct op specific, but also like try to 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 solve this impl stuff. And so in, in okay. my mind, right, like the way that I would do it, I would still have one key funk declaration, but then some have have some like internal kernel uh, dynamic static doesn't matter right it could be callbacks whatever uh, but mapping from this BTF ID that corresponds to kfunk to actual function doesn't even have to have BTF ID or it can have BTF ID but shouldn't right. be kfunk just a function right like you can whatever. like we, we have to hide the implementations from VM Linux dot H right think think in that direction right mm -hmm. so it shouldn't be kfunk visible to the user right, but it should right. be uh, something that verifier can verify still right but but the the problem is that for for what you're saying where you have multiple implementations for helpers those are implementations per program type, right? Yeah. Whereas this, you have a struct ops program type, but there's different implementations. Yes, but if you squeeze a little bit and think about callback in struct ops is its own program type, then it matches, right? It's just like how yes. you identify like different yeah. kind of programs. Yes. So I would just generalize that, right? Like so it could be program type plus maybe extra information, like in this case, the member index or whatever. Yeah, right? if we can do that, that would be that would be exactly what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's I wouldn't do it like just for struct ops because like then we will be solving it for K probes eventually, right? Because we will have some K funk that deals with stack traces. And then how you capture stack trace depends on the program type. Think about like we will have this like in, in nearest future probably. We have right now uh, getting stack traces with build IDs and it's like super restrictive, uh, like very fragile because it assumes NMI basically and all stuff. Yeah. But we have sleepable U probes, we have sleepable other programs and in those contexts like we should be able to get more reliable build ID, right? So we will already have the, the upcoming changes where like, yeah. oh, give me something but that's like in sleepable is a little bit different. I, yeah, I mean, so maybe we can make that work. The, the only thing though is again, like we have, there's only, you can have sleepable tracing programs or non-sleepable, but like at the end of the day, two sleepable tracing programs would be considered the same from the verifier's perspective, right? Whereas with struct ops, every different struct ops program is a totally different, different program. So as long as we could abstract it to something like, like we would have to build something where you could theoretically register two different tracing sleepable programs as having different functions, it just wouldn't work. But yeah, if we can make so that work. So each struct ops, if I understand correctly, right? Each struct ops provides its own set of callbacks, like for additional val yes. validations, right? So we can do it in multi steps, right? We can say that by default, unless you override something, right? BTF ID means one K funk, this is the implementation, we just go straight. But for some program types, we can declare optional callback, which will do K funk BTF ID resolution, right? Mm -hmm. And like for non-struct ops, it will be like just implementation. For struct ops, it might delegate to another per struct ops callback if that callback okay. is defined. So right? yeah, we, we so you can have this like abstracted wave just to the point of like let's resolve this k funk to actual implementation, basically. Yeah, yeah. I think that that that's. I agree with you that if we can make it apply to other program types, that's that's definitely great. But yeah, I think for struct ops, we will eventually, you will eventually have to ask the implementation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm just saying like, let's not hard code it just for struct ops because I think right. you can abstract it away into like more generic, give me implementation. Absolutely, if we can abstract it, that would be, that would be much better for sure. Question behind you? So I think I have a different use case, although I don't know if this is the right place to solve it. So I'm working on BPFQ disk, and I want um, different K funks to be, um, I want the K funk to behave different differently based on their argument. So mm. I'm trying to um, natively support adding um, SK buff into BPF, BPF list and RB tree. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we cannot just fit a existing um, BPF RB node into SK buff structure because there's no space in SK buff. So the, because there is a new ownership uh, field in BPF RB node, and so what I did is I want to skip the um, ownership track 
in when the argument is uh, SK buff and impose some different like security check, but that's irrelevant. But that's mm. might be one thing. I mean, that's something that we probably could f maybe work figure out as well. Like the verifier has semantics for all the different arguments that are going into a kfunk. So I would imagine if we have this notion of different kfunks implementations according to program type and according to other qualities, mm -hmm. maybe we could also incorporate that into like pointer to BTF ID or like pointer to pointer to SK buff. We could do a different kfunk implementation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that technically, I, th I definitely think that's possible. I guess the question would be if, if folks think that that's maybe going to become confusing or not. But I think it would be useful, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, like, yeah, like, do we think that the semantics should be completely different or could be completely different depending on how it's invoked? Or do we, should we ideally say, yeah, like, this is, you know, you can do more, you can do less, but in general, like, this kfunk is kind of doing the same thing. Like, you should roughly assume the same behavior. Because I think if you did, if we assume that, then I don't know if we could, if we, if we should necessarily, like, change owner, the ownership model, but. Yeah. If it's, like, rare one-off case, then, like, maybe special kfunk is the easier way to go. I don't want to uh, introduce another set of kfunk for different. So I, I don't know if in the future there will be other data, uh, kernel data structure wants to be enqueued into uh, BPF list or arbitrary. And for them, do we need to introduce all different like kfunks just for the same behavior? So that's my concern. I, tr I try to avoid that. Although I, right now, I solve it in, in a different way. I think we probably want to give kfunk implementations the flexibility to do what they want, right? I mean, I'm assuming for like core kfunks, we probably would push back and say no, like this, you can't have task acquire not return a reference in certain contexts. But for other ones, if it makes sense, if it serves like a sufficiently broad use case, like would we have a lot of special kfunks if we didn't enable you to kind of be, like have a lot of flexibility with one kfunk call? It's just um, um, if we introduce different kfunks for different kernel objects, into the verifier, then we just need to somehow do the same verification for the list BPF graph verification. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, and the graphs are their own whole thing, too, yeah. that are complicated. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Thanks so much. <laughs>